Thank you for being with us on Health Matters, a global virtual conference. Our next speaker is Dr. Paula Quattromoni, and the title of her presentation is Nutrition Research at Sargent College, Promoting Wellness by Informing Dietary Guidelines and Impacting Personal Behavior. She is the chairperson of the Department of Health Sciences and Associate Professor of Nutrition and Epidemiology at Boston University, where she has appointments at the College of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences, Sargent College, and the School of Public Health. Her research interests focus on school and community-based health promotion and adult and childhood obesity. She has been an investigator on one of the world's most renowned Framingham Heart Studies for more than 20 years. She's a res registered dietitian and part of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. We are so proud to have her be a faculty member. She's engaged in advocacy and volunteers for the American Heart Association on several initiatives related to childhood obesity and heart disease prevention. She is really making a difference. Let us welcome her. Thank you and welcome to Health Matters. I want to start by talking about the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. And these are a set of recommendations to help the American population make healthy choices with regards to foods and beverages that they choose in their daily lives. The Dietary Guidelines have three founding principles um, to promote balance, variety, and moderation. Nutritional balance and adequacy to make sure that we're getting the protein, the calories, the vitamins and minerals we need for our bodies, for growth and development, and for wellness. Variety to include all the different food groups in our daily diets, and moderation so that we are not overly consuming things like added sugars, sodium, fat in our diets, and also making sure we have moderation with regards to portion sizes so that we're able to achieve healthy weights. So the dietary guidelines are based on emerging scientific evidence, so a very large body of research, and they're updated every five years to um, improve the recommendations and make sure that we're helping the population protect their health. And there's many different lines of research that contribute to the dietary guidelines, and I want to use the Framingham Heart Study as one example. It's just one important contributor to how the science evolves behind the dietary guidelines. I've been very fortunate to be involved with the Framingham study for over 20 years, an incredible group of colleagues and researchers here at Boston University. Um, the Framingham study has been called um, the, the study in the town that changed America's heart. And so I'm going to use this as an illustration to help you understand how the research from Framingham helps to, um, to communicate to the dietary guidelines. So the Framingham study started back in 1948, so almost 70 years ago. And it was a time when heart disease was rising in the population and it was becoming the number one killer of Americans. And that was a real shift from the infectious diseases most people died of prior in terms of tuberculosis, uh, pneumonia, influenza. And so for heart disease, a chronic disease to be called an epidemic and the number one cause of death was really uh, a very notable transition. But at the time, we knew virtually nothing about the causes and contributors. And that's why the Framingham study was started. Before Framingham, it was pretty much considered if you got heart disease, you were unlucky. And atherosclerosis or hardening of the arteries, the plaque buildup in your blood vessels, increases in blood pressure, those were considered normal consequences of aging. And to be honest, heart disease was considered a disease of men. In fact, the Framingham study enrolled women specifically to try to figure out why they were immune to heart disease. After the first decade or so of research in Framingham, and certainly now, 70 years later, the evidence has emerged to show that women actually are affected to a huge extent by heart disease. It's the number one cause of death in women. More women die from heart disease every year, for example, than all causes of cancer, all forms of cancer combined. Framingham also identified what we now call risk factors for heart disease, including behaviors like diet and physical inactivity, as well as behaviors like smoking. 
And from Framingham, the evidence emerged that people could actually change the course of their health and wellness, and they could prevent this disease if they modified their own behaviors. And this was a marked transition where we were able to move from a traditional medical model of treating people who have a heart attack and trying to save their life when they develop heart disease, shifting to the public health model where now we can prevent heart disease by early detection and early intervention. So what happens out in Framingham? This is where we collect all of our data for research purposes. So the participants come to the clinic every two or four years, depending on the cohort that they're involved in, and they have physical exams with physicians, and we collect and measure as many things as we can, blood samples, urine samples, measurements of the body, height and weight, um, trying to understand risk for obesity as many diagnostic tests as we can afford to do and as the participants are willing to let us investigate. Um, all of this very important work funded um, large part through government funds, um, huge research initiative. And this is also where we get our information about the diet and lifestyle through interviews but also by sending the participants home to do some homework for us so that we can understand what they eat um, and how they choose their foods. So in the beginning there was a very uh, the first hypothesis about how diet might be related to heart disease was very much tied up around the um, concepts of dietary fat and cholesterol. And it had a lot to do with the process of the plaque buildup and the atherosclerosis in the arteries where over decades of time the plaque would accumulate and the blood flow would be constricted in the vessels and if a plaque came along or a blood clot formed or the plaque completely occluded the artery, the lack of blood flow, the lack of oxygen, the lack of nutrients caused damage to the heart muscle, which would be the definition of a heart attack. Um, and that is one of the longest standing hypotheses with regards to diet and heart disease. And so here's one of our first dietary guidelines that I wanted to show you some evidence from Framingham, the story about saturated fat and cholesterol. So this has been a part of our dietary guidelines for a long time, simply because it was sort of the starting point for these investigations. So in Framingham, we do have evidence that participants, both men and women, who had higher blood cholesterol and triglyceride levels um, were those participants who had more cholesterol in their diet, who had more animal protein and animal foods in their diet, and had higher fat intakes, particularly from saturated fat. But the story has really evolved from there, and we now know that it's not just about blood cholesterol as the one and only mechanism to uh, arriving at heart disease, but there are many other uh, biologic pathways and inflammatory processes and oxidative stress, things that come in from our diet, from, from our environment. And so the, the, this has allowed us to ask much more sophisticated and wide-reaching research questions. At the same time, the research has evolved to a point where we now th know that it's not just about dietary fat, that there are many other parts of diet. Some are protective, like fruits and vegetables, and nuts and fish, and others that are associated with increased risk, like um, you know, added sugars and processed foods that are very high in sodium, for example. And so this is important because it's, it's allowed us and it's encouraged us to continue to evolve the research using new methods in different ways of defining our dietary exposures. And it also helps us to shape our messages for consumers because there is no one culprit when it comes to heart disease. Heart disease is a chronic disease. It has many contributing factors and many physiologic pathways as I was just describing. So we can't relate it all back to butter or to eggs or simply attribute it to sugar. And at the, on the flip side of that, there's no single magic bullet. And so taking a supplement will never comp, you know, completely compensate for a poor quality diet. Or you know, your kale smoothie, for example, it's a wonderful antioxidant rich food, but it's not going to make up for a diet that's very heavy in processed foods. So one of the other dietary guidelines is to fill half your plate with fruits and vegetables. And we have some nice evidence on in support of that from Framingham as well, specifically with regards to stroke. And this is a survival curve showing that participants in Framingham who are higher consumers of fruits and vegetables had a significantly lower risk of having a stroke over the years of follow-up compared to the low consumers. And the quantification of that is for each three servings per day of fruits and vegetables a person consumed, it was associated with a 22 percent lower likelihood of having a stroke. That's a very substantial risk reduction. 
One of the other guidelines that's promoted from our dietary guidelines is to make half of your grains whole grains over the course of the day as you're choosing your foods. We also have some nice evidence from Framingham in support of that guideline that Framingham participants who are more likely to consume whole grains had a healthier body weight, lower risks of um, overweight and obesity. They had less body weight in their abdominal region, which is associated with heart disease and high blood pressure and diabetes risk, for example. They also had better blood lipid profiles in terms of the lower total and LDL cholesterol. And they had healthier levels of insulin, another um, indicator of metabolic wellness. We also, when we look over time, see that people in Framingham who eat more whole grains, whether fruit and vegetable fiber in addition to cereal fiber, have less weight gain over time and have less gains in their um, waist circumference. So all of these are very good indicators. Mm -hmm. But one of the most important things that Framingham has really helped to advance is the concept of looking not just at one nutrient at a time or one food group at a time, but looking at total eating patterns. And we were among one of the first research groups who really started to look at total dietary patterns, and it involved a lot more sophisticated analytical methods. And that was really an exciting time to be involved in Framingham research. So I'm just going to use the data from women as an illustration since heart disease is such an important uh, health issue for women. What we did was we took the dietary information from the women in Framingham and applied some statistics to the data to make form subgroups within the study population based on their patterns of reported food intake. And you can see that the groups are not all the same size. In fact, the largest group, almost half of all women, fell into this group we called light eaters. And they were the women who were probably more likely to be on a diet, restricting their intake, and had low overall food and calorie intake. About one-fifth of women were what we called heart-healthy eaters, and they were the closest to meeting the dietary guidelines. They ate more fish, more whole grains, more legumes, um, healthier types of oils in their diet, lower fat intake overall. A very small segment of women um, we call the wine and moderate eating group, and they had kind of middle of the road eating patterns, but what set them apart from the other groups was that they were enjoying wine on a pretty daily basis, on average about two glasses of wine a day, which is a bit higher, well it's double the amount that the dietary guidelines recommend for women. And our last two groups um, were sort of similar in, with regards to they both had very high fat intakes, but they, se they separated out because the dietary behaviors that drove that fat intake was, were actually quite different. So the high fat group of women were more likely to get their fat from added on fat like mayonnaise, salad dressing, butters, gravies, whereas this empty calorie group turned out to be very interesting and most of their fat came from hidden fat in foods like potato chips, baked goods, processed foods. So not only were, was that group high in fat intake but because of the processed food nature it sort of had a triple whammy. It was also high in sodium and high in added sugars as well. So you can think of these as one in the other end of the spectrum with our heart healthy eaters being closest to the dietary guidelines and then our empty calorie eaters probably looking like this in the aisles of the supermarket. So when we compared each of those different subgroups of women in Framingham to the heart healthy group, it was that empty calorie group that kept standing out with regards to increased risk. They had a 40% higher risk of becoming overweight. They had a 40% higher risk of developing the metabolic syndrome, which is a clustering of risk factors that increases your risk for diabetes as well as heart disease. They had an 18% higher likelihood of developing heart disease and more than double the likelihood of having carotid artery disease, which is a major precursor for stroke in an early indicator of cardiovascular disease. So this is just one example of how the research evolves over time and how Framingham has contributed to the story. And it's just been very exciting to be part of this at Boston University to see my students get involved in the Framingham research and to have such a wonderful base of colleagues here at Boston University who are experts in lifestyle and in cardiovascular medicine and in public health and health promotion and you know truly earning the name of the you know Framingham being the town that changed America's heart it's not surprising that Framingham is counted among the top 10 medical marvels of the century because of its contributions to establishing these guidelines for preventing heart disease and stroke and how it's helped to inform you know, how we communicate to the population about making choices in our daily lives that will protect our health. 
So I'm Paula Quattrimoni with the Framingham Heart Study and with Sargent College at Boston University. And thank you so much for joining us today for Health Matters.